our great pleasure. It's our pleasure to have uh, Fabio Pusateri from Univer University of Toronto. And uh, uh, he graduated from Quran Institute with Jala Shata and then spent a few years at Princeton. Uh, and uh, now he's at uh, Toronto. And uh, he is going to talk about some recent results on solitons kinks and radiation damping. Seems like uh, the result of a big group of collaborators. <laughs> yes. Please go ahead. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Zhang Jun and uh, Andre for the invitation and uh, Carl Yifeng for the organization of the whole seminar. Uh, so it's a pleasure to to be here and see also so many faces I haven't seen uh, in a while. Uh, hopefully, I get to see more of you as I start traveling again, traveling again. Uh, okay, so this is um, sort of a fairly general talk. Um, most of it is not going to be technical, and I'm going to present, discuss some recent results on uh, solid on stability, kinks, and then uh, something about radiation dumping towards the end. And as John Jun was saying, it's based on uh, many works. So been, we've been working for the past uh, maybe five, six years, seven, so with Pierre Germain, starting with early work with Federico Crusset, and then a couple of work with Gong Chen, uh, some works, uh, uh, one work with David Sofer, and then even more recently with more uh, younger postdocs, uh, Tristan Leger, uh, Catherine Zhang and uh, Adilbeck Garjan. So I'm going to mention them again as I go through uh, some of the results. But just in case I don't get to that. Yeah. All right, so first let me start with some basic examples and questions. So I'm sorry to the experts. Uh, these are going to be very basic, but hopefully um, going to be good for the whole audience. And, uh, and then discuss some what are the questions we're interested in, some general difficulties, what kind of classical methods are and what we're trying to do uh, to solve some new problems. Um, and it's gonna be like two main classes of problems. So one is one dimensional problems where we look at the essentially field theories and arising Klein-Gordon equations, so massive wave equations. And uh, we're gonna see some results about stability of kinks and solidons. Um, and, and then I'm gonna talk about something in three dimensions, uh, which is the phenomenon of radiation dumping. It's kind of connected. All right, so let's see if I can. So I'm trying to, okay, good. So, in general, we're interested in uh, nonlinear PDs uh, of dispersive or wave type and in the dynamical stability or instability of special solutions, such as solidons or kinks. So, kinks are a simple example of topological solidons. Um, I'll say more about this later. And so, the simplest, most basic example of a solidon, basically the first uh, hit you get when you Google it, it's uh, is this picture here on the left, where you see we get in an experiment, essentially you have a shallow and uh, narrow canal. There is some force that puts in motion water and it creates a nice uh, smooth like hump profile like this, uh, which peaks in the middle and then decays very rapidly. And this preserves the, uh, the, its shape for a very, very long time as it travels. So this is essentially a KDV solidon already found out uh, about 200 years ago by Scott Russell. Now on the right, instead, there's some other uh, special solution of some, in this case, it's, a, it's, it's an ODE, but, but then in the continuous limit, you will get a PD. And this is a chain of uh, coupled pendula here to the right. And you can see that, so they're, they're kept together by um, some, some force here between them. And uh, so starting from the left, they're pointing down, and then you have a solution that where basically the, the angles rotate, uh, you go up, and then it comes down on the other side, right? So, and this is an example. So if you let, if you take a proper scaling, uh, then this chain of coupled pendula basically will converge to what's uh, uh, known as the sine gordon equation, which I'll write later. Uh, but for now, let's just observe it's a special solution of a PD, let's say, um, that connects two trivial states. So one would be theta equal zero and theta is equal to two pi, uh, but it's not localized in space. So unlike the picture on the left, where the solution goes to zero at both ends, like here you connect two states uh, that are not uh, equivalent. And so in particular, this solution cannot be deformed uh, to something that has uh, somehow trivial topology, if you wish. So this is kind of, if it had a winding number of one. Okay, so that's kind of and one difference in practice that this is a non-localized uh, solution in space. 
then I'm having some troubles uh, scrolling. Let me see if, okay, it's a bit slow. All right, uh, so then solidons are coherent structures in general that emerge from balancing linear uh, forces and nonlinear focusing interactions in PDs. And they play a key role in our understanding of uh, the time evolution of complex systems that are sort of supposed to be the building blocks of the whole dynamics. And of course, they appear in many, many areas. Mostly I'll discuss field theories, maybe some quantum mechanics. Now, it's a very classical uh, subject, the study of uh, stability and stability of solidons. Now you have just some names. Of course, there's many, many contributions through the years, uh, starting really like Shadow Strauss, Weinstein, and Bates and Johnson, and so on. And uh, But if you think about uh, topological solidons, uh, there's much less known from a mathematical kind of analytical point of view, right? This is something uh, well known and well studied, I guess, in uh, math physics, physics, but from the analysis point of view, uh, much less, even for simple 1D examples, such as the kink of the previous slide. And so this is one thing that I'd like to understand. Sorry, still, okay. So what's the general goal will be to describe globally in space and time, the dynamics of physical systems that have these special solutions. And of course, we should start with something that is close by, uh, but in general, like a long-term goal is a solid resolution conjecture, which says roughly that all reasonable solutions will decompose asymptotically in time as a sum of these coherent structures, possibly sitting at different locations and different uh, scales, plus some other uh, remainder term. So this is a general thing has recently been proven actually in some models. Um, and it's not really our goal because we want to look more at topological solidons and there uh, we really uh, can't say things only locally, if, if anything at all. So that's kind of the picture. Now, in practice, so practical examples. So the first one is KDV, which is essentially the first picture on the slide where you have this uh, Cauch minus two um, solidon that travels at speed C with amplitude C. At speed actually, yes, C to the three halves. Well, speed C, actually. Yeah, sorry. Then, um, more interesting, a little closer to the picture on the right at the beginning is the 5 4 model. So, here uh, you have a wave equation, squared minus dx squared, and then uh, a nonlinearity that's coming from an energy density given by a double well potential. And so you see zero, and uh, so here zero is a solution, of course, but also minus one and one. And uh, phi naught, the tangent hyperbolic here, is a solution that connects minus one at minus infinity to one at infinity. It's the, probably the simplest example of a kink. Now you could replace uh, the nonlinearity uh, by something else. So you could change uh, the potential energy density. So if this is the double well, then you get the phi four I just showed. Uh, but you could have different uh, energy density profiles. So in general, phi zero is called the kink. And as we observed, it's not localized in space. So I always have technical problems scrolling. So it'll be a little slow. Um, okay, but for example, if you change the U uh, and you take half P squared minus one over P plus one, to the P plus one, you will get the standard uh, uh, focusing Klein Gordon, which also meets a solidon similar to the KDV one, also static. So shape is the same. And you can have other models that admit kings. So, for example, the sine Gordon model, this will be given by a U of the form one minus cosine phi. And it's a known uh, integrable equation. And then you can perturb that. So, you can add, say, the next. Uh, a coefficient in the free expansion of u, and here I just write u prime. So if you add sine phi, which will come from the sine Gordon, and then you add uh, a sine two phi, you get something that's called a double sine Gordon. So this is sort of a non-integrable perturbation of, of sine Gordon. Okay, now just one example in two dimensions, you can look at uh, the Ginzburg Landau model. Uh, and if you look at solutions uh, that are a radial function times e to the i theta times n, uh, so solutions that wind around zero n times, uh, you can find these vortices which converge to one at infinity. So these are vortices on the plane, and this is the energy uh, for that uh, for this model, which is essentially right. So very reminiscent of the one you would get for the for the phi four. 
So this is kind of a natural uh, two-dimensional generalization of a king, if you wish. All right. So if you want to start the analysis, you start close to a king here, and you look at the solution in the form of king plus a small perturbation, and you linearize and see uh, what's the equation that comes out. So if you do that, you will essentially get zero wave equation on the left, then you expand uh, the phi minus phi cubed. And because phi naught here uh, converges uh, to minus one and one, this gives an effective mass of root of two, and you will get a Klein-Gordon equation, which has uh, a quadratic nonlinearity. So you get a Klein-Gordon equation here on the left with a potential that decays rapidly to zero. And you get nonlinearities that are cubic and more importantly, quadratic with a coefficient given by phi naught, which in particular, uh, it's not localized in space. So if you were thinking of doing the same thing for a solid, then you will get something that is localized. So in some sense, that should be easier to control, at least in, in general situations. And then if you want to analyze this, uh, you have to, uh, well, understand, I guess, these PDs at the linear level first, and then at the nonlinear level. And um, the question then that we want to address is that of asymptotic stability in time. So you give initially a state uh, phi where u is small and you're close to uh, the king phi naught. And then you want to study for a long time the evolution of, of u. Okay. And if possible, prove that uh, um, maybe you have some decay over time and you converge something, you converge back to something that has to do with, with phi naught. This is just by means of an example of what one would like to try to do. And so in all these models, you need some linear analysis to know the spectrum uh, of the linear operator. And this will tell you some properties of the time evolution, at least for linear solutions. Then you try to prove that uh, these um, properties, if you can, pass also to the nonlinear solution. And then you need some nonlinear analysis. And here, one thing that it's uh, harder with respect to standard solidons is indeed that phi naught does not decay to zero. Okay, so you're really dealing with the quadratic nonlinearity. And that's what, what was uh, one of the things that kind of get us, got us started with the Pierre Germain in trying to understand these equations in general with quadratic nonlinearities as arising uh, from these models. Right, so in general, the ideal result you try to get is the following. So you want to write your solution uh, starting from a vicinity of a kink has. Uh, some possibly modulated version of the kink because the equation has some symmetry. So this kink could move. Uh, you could have more symmetries of the equation. And then some kind of radiation component, which you can think of um, either some kind of small uh, copy of a small linear solution or something that decays fast. And then depending here on the spectrum, you may also have like some other parts that are arising from the presence of discrete spectrum. So and it could also be stable. So we'll see an example in 3D about this later. But we don't have this picture essentially for any, um, for any kink. So we have simplified pictures where there is no, no modulation. So the kink is uh, static, stays there. And then you have a perturbation that decays and we can say what the behavior is. But in general, this is what you would, uh, you would expect. Right. So before going into how we analyze these models, um, there's other notions of stability one can, one can look at. And the first one is uh, orbital stability. So for example, for this model, this is known from the 80s, but in general, there's a general theory starting with Gilagish Sada Strauss, where you try to prove that your solution, say in an energy space, uh, stays close to the manifold of, uh, in this case, the kink. Uh, modulated by the symmetries of the equation. So you start close epsilon, then you stay epsilon close. Then you can prove something slightly stronger, which is, or actually quite stronger, which is if you look at the perturbation, but you stay uh, fixed in space on a time inter, on a fixed space interval, and then you let time go to infinity, then this goes to zero. So this is known as asymptotic stability, and it's sort of local in the energy space. So the perturbation doesn't just stay uh, small, but also goes to zero, at least locally. And this, for example, for this model was proven uh, 
quite recently and kind of revived uh, a whole series of works uh, and a lot of interest for these models. All right, so and please feel free to, to interrupt, uh, ask questions, and I can, can write. All right, so in general, let's think of an equation of this form, uh, possibly even in different dimensions. So you have a wave equation, then you have a mass, so Klein Gordon, then you have an external potential, could be large, coming from linearizing around some solution, and then you have a quadratic nonlinearity. Okay, with A possibly non localized, then you can have cubic and more. Um, so, in general, for these problems that we're interested in, the dimension will be low, uh, the powers also will be non localized and, uh, and low, right? Starting with quadratic, say. This means that you expect from the nonlinear solution sort of a slow decay because of the dimension being low. And uh, you can get by uh, using linear theory or sort of more uh, tools, classical tools like uh, local decay or streakers. Somehow this can tell you something, but not the whole picture. And we also expect that uh, the behavior of the solutions is more nonlinear, right? So, and so we have to capture this nonlinear asymptotic phenomena. And in particular, what you need to understand first is um, take uh, linear waves, say solutions of this linear equation, and study their interaction uh, when they're localized, uh, but on the background of a potential, right? So we want to uh, pretend you start with two nice waves that are localized, you evolve them, and then you have to do the product. Of course, and you have to say to see how they they sort of uh, interact with the with the linear part of the equation. So this is something that uh, want us to do, and turns out not to be uh, that simple. So if you didn't have v, so if v was zero, which is what we call the free of the flat case, for example, if you were perturbing something around the trivial state, uh, then there are many classical nonlinear methods. Uh, here I start only from the eighties, but even from before, so a uh, method of vector fields and normal forms. You can do Fourier analysis, multilinear estimates. So these are kind of things that have been used uh, quite a bit. Uh, but now, once you turn on the V, uh, you can't quite use this classical method and one needs to do something different. And this is because um, if you are in the, what we call the perturbed or distorted case or non-flat or non-homogeneous, so you have V is not zero, then, uh, this already destroys the invariance of the equation. So some you can recover easily, some uh, are lost and it's harder to, to recover them. So you can't really use uh, commuting vector fields. Also for your analysis becomes more difficult because now you don't have uh, the property that if you multiply two functions, then the frequency of the output is the sum of the frequencies. So that we'll see more later how it manifests in the analysis. And because of all this also, you expect more coherent and kind of resonant nonlinear interactions. So these are things that we kind of know already in advance we have to deal with. And so we, we try. So what we're trying to do is to use uh, the distorted Fourier transform, which is the Fourier transform adapted to the Schrodinger operator, minus Laplace and plus V, and try to use harmonic analysis in this context. So this is our approach. And so let me say just briefly what the distorted Fourier transform is, then I'll state some results. So just very briefly, so I can actually, I can use the transform to state things. So if you have a nice potential, uh, you can look at uh, solutions of the uh, eigenvalue equation here, psi with eigenvalue mu. And if mu is mod of k squared, you have bounded solutions that behave like exponentials at in, so at infinity as if v was zero. And then you can have also uh, eigenfunctions with the associated negative eigenvalues. You can have different behaviors at uh, mu equals zero, but let's for now uh, not talk about that. And what you can do is essentially build a transform using uh, this generalized eigenfunctions psi as you, would, as you would use the exponentials. So superficially, not much is changing here. Um, so you would take your f, integrate against psi bar, and this you call f tilde. Uh, that's the Fourier transform of f. 
And then you can also project on the eigenfunctions with negative eigenvalues and then reconstruct by integrating against Psi. So here you take F tilde, you integrate against Psi and you get back F, adding back also the discrete uh, projections. And this is something classical from the 50s and 60s, which we now try to use at a nonlinear level, so for nonlinear PDs. The good thing about the distorted Fourier transform is that, um, like the Fourier transform diagonalizes the constant coefficient operator, so does the Fourier transform for the non-constant coefficient operator where you have uh, minus Laplace and plus V. So after applying the Fourier transform, uh, then doing this operation amounts to multiplying by K squared on the Fourier side. And then you get all the functional calculus that uh, follows from that. Then we'll see what happens at the nonlinear level. But first, let's go back to uh, this one dimensional classical field theories of the form wave equation is equal to uh, some uh, force coming from uh, a U, which is a double well, essentially. So you have these models that I wrote down before. Uh, so one is the phi four with this double well. You have the sine Gordon and you have the double sine Gordon where the potential now written slightly differently from before is this. And all of them admit kinks. The analytic expression for this uh, phi eta, so eta here is a parameter. Uh, the expression is too complicated. I didn't fit on the slide. So, so eta here, it, it's just an R. But there are some pictures here to the left. So I think here eta is negative. So this is minus one, this is one. And these are the pictures of the of the U, and this is the picture of uh, one of the kinks uh, for, I think, 0 0.5, yeah, minus 0 0.5. And the last one to the right is the picture of the potential you get in the linearization. And these are pictures from uh, CD6 paper of uh, Campbell, Perar, Sudano, where they were trying to see the interaction of two kinks and showing that this model is non-integrable, basically. Okay. So all of the models above, they all have linearization, like the model we were talking about before, this time in 1D, where you have uh, Klein-Gordon plus potential is equal to quadratic plus cubic. They have different spectral properties. So now the spectrum of, of this operator is different for the three models before. But what we tried to say, so with Pierre Germain was, okay, let's look at the general equation like this and then see uh, if we can get some long time stability result and then apply it where we can apply it. And then, you know, we'll have to do more in the cases where we can't apply this. So, and the result, which was then also uh, simplified in parts uh, with uh, and work with uh, Zhang Zhang more recently is the following. So you take small initial data, which is regular enough and, and localized. So localized is here is in the sense of putting a weight X and measuring in L2. And then you assume that you have no negative eigenvalues. Okay, but that wouldn't be a big deal. If you can project them away, you can still work with that. Um, and then we have a technical assumption that has to do with the behavior at, uh, at zero energy. That maybe, let me not discuss it for now. So we assume that the distorted Fourier transform at the frequency zero vanishes. Okay, so this will be true for some models, not for others, but it's a generic condition. And then under these assumptions, we can prove that uh, you get uh, a unique global solution that it stays small and it decays like a linear solution of Klein-Gordon would uh, decay. So it's the mass maximal possible decay. And then we study the asymptotic behavior and we show that actually you get in the distorted Fourier space, some form of modified scattering. So you don't converge to a linear solution, um, but here S, so here F is the profile of U. So you take U and you pull back the linear flow. And we show that this converges, doesn't converge to a constant, um, but it converges to something that it's a profile times uh, a logarithmic in time uh, phase modification. This is something that happens uh, for many models that are critical, for example, uh, cubic NLS and many others. But here, just to get there, it's a little uh, harder. And I'll show you some of the ideas for the how to use the free transform to, to look at this problem. So let me know if there's, if there's questions. Also, I guess if you wanna type in the chat, you can I take a look once in a while. 
All right. So it turns out that, right, so the double sign Gordon equation showed before, it has uh, families of kings for uh, negative eta that have, that satisfy the assumptions of the theorem. And in particular, um, if we take odd perturbations, so they don't have to, to move around, we get that kings of the double sign Gordon equation are centrally stable under odd perturbations. So you start with a small perturbation, and then this perturbation will stay small, decay over time, and behave as the solution u of the theorem above. So u plays the role of the perturbation in the previous theorem. And for kings, this was uh, the first result of this type, where we get stability on the whole real line, and as time goes to infinity, we can, we can tell what's happening to the perturbation. So now let me give some ideas of, uh, of how we, we proceed. And to do it, let me just take a general model. So we don't have to stick to, to Klein-Gordon or the double sign gordon just to, to give an idea also because this is gonna be relevant for 3D later. Um, so let me just work in general with something that it's, it's simple to write. So we take the Schrodinger equation here, I dt u minus Laplacian u, I add the potential, which is larger than the quadratic nonlinearity. And let me work with this, whatever I'm gonna say, it's fairly general. Then when we need something more specific, I go back to the, to the model we have. So what we want to do is, first of all, define the profile f by pulling back the linear flow. So now dtf is a quadratic expression in u and then transform. So when I take the free transform, it just works as if it wasn't there. So f tilde is gonna be to the minus i t and k squared u tilde. And then, I'm gonna write the equation for f. So i dt f is gonna be e to the minus i t is k squared and Fourier transform of u squared, which is the integration against psi bar. And each of the u's is uh, the inverse transform of the transform. So it's the integration against psi of u tilde. And so now I can get an expression just in terms of the transforms. Then each of the u's is an exponential phase e to the i t l squared here times f tilde of l. And then here in this mu, you gather all the, the psi's. So this one, this one, and this one integrated over x. So I'll, I think I read it later, yes. Um, so this is what, what you get. Now, if v wasn't there, then each of these psi's will just be a regular exponential. And then if you multiply uh, three exponentials here, you will get a delta of k minus l minus m. And therefore, once you plug it in, you will get that this whole expression will be a convolution. So if, in other words, I think I read this here. In other words, if you were in the free case, then mu would be a delta of the sum of these frequencies, um, and you would recover the fact that taking the transform of a product gives you the convolution of the transforms. But now here, things are different because k doesn't have to be L plus M. And, uh, and so we call this object uh, nonlinear spectral distribution. And then we have to analyze it to understand the, the evolution of the solution U and through the evolution of the transform of the profile F tilde. And so here I write the same equation. So this is this equation, but I integrate it over, it over time. So if I integrate from zero to T, this is what I get. And mu, Again, is this expression. So it's the integral over x of the multiplication of three generalized eigenfunctions at three different frequencies, k, l, and m. And then the idea, the general idea is that you can try to control um, the solution by controlling this time and frequency integral, exploiting oscillations and cancellation. This is a non-stationary phase point of view of Germain Masmoudi Shada and the Gustafsson Agenshian Sai, for example, which was very uh, su successful in dealing with several problems, including quasarina problems and uh, waterways, for example, and was extended upon by, by many. And, but in this case, uh, so we don't have just a delta, but we have this kind of different uh, distribution. And so we need to analyze the structure and the singularities. And one thing that uh, I'll try to show is that uh, you can do this in 1D. There is some algebra to do. Uh, but somehow in 1D, 
things are a bit more explicit because you can write uh, what the size are a bit more explicitly thanks to linear scattering theory. But then if the dimension is bigger than one, then things are more complicated. So I'll try to explain also what we do in that case. Okay. So let's let's talk about uh, some ideas for the proof of the theorem on uh, uh, Klein-Gordon equation with, with Germain. So, and we stick to dimension one now. So in dimension one, uh, if you want to look at one of these evolution PDs, so the first thing you would ask is, what does the linear solution do? So if I look at the linear evolution of some function f, then you can prove that if f is localized enough, then you have uh, a certain rate of decay. And that's the maximum you can have by scaling considerations. You can have sort of more refined estimates like the one in the, in the second line, but for now, let's not worry. And, and you can have analogs, so if you're in other dimensions, there's many people who work just on trying to prove uh, this kind of linear estimates, and they're non-trivial. Uh, but then if you want to do like also non-linear estimate, you can see uh, from, uh, from here, for example, that one thing you would like to control is some kind of localized norm. And so in particular, it's convenient to work in L2, so you would try to control a derivative of F tilde uh, in L2, okay, which sort of corresponds to measuring the localization. And so you have to apply partial K to the integral ab above, um, but now you need to study the mu. So, so the mu, which was the integral of these three generalized eigenfunctions, uh, in one dimension can be written as something that is singular and something that is regular. Regular is like a regular function we can differentiate. And the singular part has a delta, which you would expect if V was zero, and plus it does something that looks like the principal value of one over, and you can have all possible combinations of uh, linear combinations of K, L, and N. So this comes out as you write out what the psi's are, they're made by exponentials of plus or minus I X K, and they're different uh, as in, at infinity and minus infinity. So you put all together, there is some algebra and you can see that it looks something like that, times some coefficients that are supposedly harmless. And then this one you wanna plug into your equation. So if you go back now to the, Klein Gordon, we had this uh, integral expression and up to changing variables here, um, I wanna plug in what the mu is and I'm just gonna look at this term. And then each of the Fs comes with its own uh, linear oscillation. And this is the linear oscillation of the um, output. And then we study this. So these are the only like kind of two more technical slides. Uh, but one idea is that if you are close to the singularity of this principal value, uh, then in principle, your oscillations as P goes to zero, are kind of closer to the oscillations you would have if V wasn't there, so if the potential wasn't there. And so you can try to adapt uh, the theory for the V equals zero case. And in particular for Klein-Gordon, you can do some, a normal form. So you can transform quadratic terms into cubic, which will give you a higher order perturbation. So that, that's good. But now if P is not uh, close to the singularity, um, this is a smooth function, but then you lose the fact that uh, now the sum of uh, K, L, and this third thing now doesn't sum to zero. So if you wanna look at uh, oscillations of this function or when it vanishes, uh, then you have possibly more solution because now the frequencies are uncorrelated. I don't know if you can see, maybe I should put this up here. So now the frequencies that are interacting, they don't sum to zero. And this is because essentially you have the potential which changes, uh, it could change um, the frequency of your solutions interacting. So it could move them uh, around. I'll have maybe a picture about this later. Let me see, how am I doing on time? Okay. About at least 15 minutes, 15 to okay, like maybe 20 minutes, yeah. All right, so, okay, so then uh, what happens in this case? So here we have this kind of a expression uh, in Fourier space and um, what one can see by doing some kind of formal asymptotic analysis is that um, even in, in our case, let's say of our theorem, when we assume that these functions vanish at zero, what we get after applying partial k is something singular. 
So the hope of uh, bounding actually a norm like the one that you would normally do uh, uh, is lost. So you get something similar of the form, uh, the distance between k and root of three. So this root of three comes out uh, from the expression here. If you put uh, zero for L and this other thing, then k has to be root of three for this to be zero. Because the Japanese, Japanese k is the square root of k squared plus one. So if k is root of three, this comes out to be two, which is one plus one. And then, um, so this is a bad frequency that comes out from this analysis. It's not in L2, so we have to kind of adjust uh, the space where we try to bound our solution. And we see that if, if you were to uh, multiply by a power of, uh, of K, then we'll make it less singular. And so this is the type of norm, of course, kind of oversimplifying, but this is the type of norm you try to say. So you try to bound. So you try to say that partial K of F tilde is singular as you approach this frequency, then depending on the problem, may be more or less singular. Sometimes the problem may have cancellation, which actually uh, prevent this singularity. But so we try to work in a space that is uh, quite general and would allow for a singularity. And this is because, this is because maybe I'll, let me get to this a little later. Um, this is because having singularities is kind of the general situation you expect. So also if you violate the assumptions of the theorem, on the zero energy. So if you have something that's called a non-generic potential, you expect something that is singular, maybe even a bit more than that. And if you have uh, something that's called an internal mode, which I'll discuss just in the next slide. So it's kind of a general situation. Even if you have more complete spectrum, you expect uh, at the nonlinear level to create a, uh, a degeneracy at sub bad frequencies. And this we can kind of handle at least partially in our theorem. And but for example, in the two-dimensional case, when V is zero for quasi-linear problem, these kind of things were already observed in works on the other Maxwell by Dengenesco and Pasader, and also uh, with myself on gravity capillary waves. So we were able to kind of push this to the one-dimensional case and obtain some results for kinks. Okay, let me skip this part. So what is the general picture before I try to move maybe to 3D? Is the following. So the, the result um, with Pierre-Germain is essentially about the trivial spectrum. So you linearize and, and nothing happens. So you have continuous spectrum uh, here to the right of the mass. And then you have no negative eigenvalues, nothing at the, at the bottom of the spectrum. Now, more things could happen. So first you could have negative eigenvalues. For example, if you look at the, uh, sorry, don't know of nonlinear Klein Gordon. Uh, you have a negative eigenvalue. This is exponentially unstable, but you can still try to construct uh, stable manifolds by sort of projecting that away and then study on the stable manifold the asymptotic behavior. Then uh, you could have, now I'm proceeding from, from left to right on the spectrum. So you could have zero as an eigenvalue. So zero is always an eigenvalue due to translation. You can avoid it by imposing some symmetry so that things cannot translate. And that's what's been done so far. But for example, if I have a kink and it moves, is it stable? So this we don't know. There's no, no example for in the sense of stability that we're looking at. So stability on the whole real line and uh, time going to infinity. Then you can have an eigenvalue here in the gap between zero and the mass. And this is called an internal mode. At the linear level, this generates a stable uh, solution that is time periodic and localized. And for example, this is what happens for the five-fold kink. And then the same question is, can you have long time stability? And there's some partial results, for example, of the Lormas Moody, which I'll mention on the next slide. And then as we move more to the right, you can have a resonance uh, at the bottom of the spectrum. Uh, in particular, uh, this will mean that uh, the value of the free transform at zero is not zero, which is what uh, we actually assumed, right? That it was zero in our theorem. And it's what happens for the sine Gordon king. And then you can ask the same question about long time stability. And there's some partial results, but the picture is still to be to be very much completed uh, in one dimension. And so these are these are some results. So maybe let me put all of them here and then comment on some. These are kind of recent works. Uh, so you see above is the same picture with the spectrum, and then there are scholars where basically this says that this works address like one of these issues. There's many works by Kovacs, Martin Munoz on local asymptotic stability. So let me. Maybe not talk about this, although they're, they're very important, starting with one of the five four. Uh, 
but kind of closer in spirit to what we are doing is one work of uh, Delor Masmudi, where they look at uh, the five for kink, hot perturbations, and prove like its stability for times epsilon to the minus four, where epsilon is the size of the perturbation. Um, and so this is kind of consistent also with the result uh, that we had uh, with Pierre Germain. So somehow we use different techniques, but that both could kind of tackle the same problem. And then there is a, a full asymptotic stability result, like the one we want to obtain for out perturbation of the sign Gordon King by Lurman and Schlag, where here what happens is that the equation actually cancels the singularity. So it has a special mass structure, and so one can get uh, one can get by also with simpler spaces. Uh, and then more works on uh, on solitons. So for example, if P is four from the linear Klein Gordon, uh, we could prove asymptotic stability sharp decay. Now, if P is three, there is a resonance at the bottom of the spectrum. There was just a recent result by Lurman and Schlag, kind of using this uh, functional framework adapted to the singularity to get something almost exponentially uh, decaying on the stable manifold. So this is, and then there's more works uh, we're done with Gong Chen, for example, looking at uh, uh, non, so looking at here at uh, non-generic cases. So where you do have a resonance at the bottom of the spectrum, so it's red in many prior works and sort of that build up to, to this. So maybe this is kind of, a, of the picture in 1D. Now maybe briefly in last, I guess, uh, five, 10 minutes, um, let's see what happens in 3D. So there's an extensive either, of course, on solitons, but then we're interested in when you have low dimensions, so two or three. Um, here, let's, let's talk about uh, result in 3D. And you have quadratic powers. So this will be models uh, for the linearization around the uh, topological solitons. But even before we get to more complicated models, like even basic things, I think, were not understood until recently. For example, if you had uh, a Schrodinger equation with the quadratic nonlinearity, or if you had a Klein Gordon, same with quadratic nonlinearity, possibly non tiber spectrum. And so we had two results recently. Well, maybe not so recently, starting from a couple of years ago. So on two basic models, so let me put them out. So one is you look at Schrodinger and you assume you have trivial spectrum, you are in uh, three dimensions and we can prove global decay and scattering for solutions uh, for generic B without bound states for a quadratic nonlinearity. But I think the main thrust of this work is that we set up uh, the analysis of localized waves and this use of the distorted Fourier transform at the nonlinear level in 3D. Maybe I want to show briefly how it really differs from the 1D case. Although, of course, the starting point and inspiration is, is similar. And then we had a work actually uh, where we have uh, spectrum with an internal mode. So there is a, an eigenvalue between zero and the mass and a quadratic nonlinearity. So this was known for a cubic nonlinearity from work of Sofer and Weinstein, I think in 99. Or 2000, and then we were able to do it for a quadratic uh, nonlinearity. Essentially, this is the same as the 5 4 problem, but in three dimensions. So one gains quite a bit going to two dimensions in terms of decay, but then it's still non trivial. And I'll, I'll show the theorem. And it's also what happens, for example, if you linearize around the quadratic, uh, so a solid on of quadratic kg, you also get an internal mode plus the negative eigenvalue. And um, we use somehow this Fermi Golden Rule addition dumping mechanism. Maybe I won't have time to get into that, but something that was started by Siegel beginning of the 90s. And then we observed that the solution already has uh, a lot of kind of nonlinear features and growths that we were not necessarily expecting. So, in some sense, solving this problem, although it's in 3D, um, it puts a, a lower bound, right? So, maybe an, an upper bound on your expectations for the lower dimensional problem, right? So it gives you lower bounds in terms of bounds that you cannot, you cannot beat um, if you go down to the dimension. So maybe just state the result. Um, so we have a Klein-Gordon equation, but then we assume that um, there is um, an eigenvalue, right? So above zero, so in the gap between zero and the mass. So this is continuous spectrum dashed, then there is an eigenvalue here, lambda, or lambda squared. 
Okay, so what happens is that because of that, the linear equation has uh, time periodic localized solutions, which are called, uh, well, also internal modes by abuse of notation, kind of model topological defects, or as if you had a particle and then you wanted to interact with your, your continuous field U. And the question is whether this persists after you turn on the nonlinearity. So you have this in the linear flow, they don't decay, then I turn on the nonlinearity, does it actually um, destroy these, these states? And it turns out that it does. Um, and this, it was known that they're destroyed, but then from works of Siegel, and then it was proved in the cubic case what the behavior is of this, uh, they're called metal stable states that arise from this. And basically what happens is that this kind of uh, solution uh, will transfer energy to the continuous spectrum and then decay, but very slowly compared to a solution of the equation, either the linear equation or the equation without, without the eigenvalue. And so the idea is that if you had a, a physical model, then you should at least be able to treat this um, quadratic nonlinearity. And so the statement is as follows. So you look at uh, U is your solution, and then you decompose it into something that it's the projection on the continuous spectrum and something that projects on the eigenvalue and some amplitude A. And then we want to say things about uh, basically A and V. And the result is that if you uh, assume an essentially a non-degeneracy condition that has to do with a special uh, frequency, which is the one that uh, the internal mode would force. It's called the Fermi, basically Fermi frequency. So if you have that this uh, expression is not zero and we take small data that is regular, then we can prove that the solution is global and, and decays. And what happens is that the amplitude of the internal oscillations, so of this uh, eigenfunction decays slowly at this rate of one over root of t. The nonlinear solution behaves, so decays uh, like one over t and no epsilon. So there's no smallness. So this is sharp. So you get one, one over t, which is much slower than what the normal linear solution would be because in three dimensions, that would be t to the three halves. And also it's not small at this, uh, uh, at this level. Uh, in particular, the limb soup of uh, v tilde is, uh, is one. So this will be like a natural thing that you would expect. So you start small, you would expect it to stay small, uh, but then it actually grows. And then we have also more, more things that grow. So if you look at the weighted norm, then it would actually grow at a, a pretty fast rate. And the idea is maybe how many, tell me how many minutes, one, two, or five, then I can decide. Yeah, you can probably use a few more minutes. Okay, so just to give an idea of what happens in, in 3D. The starting point is the same as, uh, as the 1D, where we write everything in the in Fourier space and essentially have to look at an oscillatory integral where uh, this mu comes up. And mu is the integral of uh, three generalized eigenfunctions. But now the eigenfunctions satisfy APD, so that would satisfy minus Laplace and psi uh, plus V psi is uh, K squared. So this will be psi of K. So in particular, at infinity, they will decay only like one over X, while in 1D, they decay as fast as V, basically. So, because in 1D, you will be solving an ODE. So we write, uh, so in the work with Sofer and then with the Leger, so we write uh, Psi as the plane exponential uh, plus a perturbation, which decays only like one over X. And then we have to plug all of this back into into mu. Say so first we expand a little bit more psi one, just as the radial uh, scattered wave. And once you plug in, then you have to take expressions like this. So three of them, one at k, one at l, one at m, and then plug them into mu. And for example, one of the expressions will be plane wave for k, plane wave for l, and then this uh, radial scattered wave at m. So you analyze this expression and you see how they look like. And they look like the um, principal value of here is p, so mod p minus mod q, where one of the two is the sum of two frequencies. So, for example, in, in the previous picture, I think p was uh, k minus l and q was m. And then you have this analysis of the mu. 
you need some bounds for bilinear operators that have these as singular, these singular kernels. In particular, if you restrict them on annuli, you want to prove that they are bounded. They satisfy LPLQ estimates. So holder type estimates. And what you see is that because you have all possible combinations of exponentials and radius scalar wave, you never find a direction in which this is regular because P could be K plus L or it could be K plus M or it could be L or it could be M and the other could be the what's, what's left. And so it's never regular. So there's no way to be able to integrate by parts and get uh, some cancellations unless you split all this up. And likely, so you can split them in, you can split it in many pieces and you have at least one regular direction for each. And then you hope that this is enough to, uh, to give enough cancellations in your nonlinear expression and, and control the solution. Maybe I'll just end with just saying that uh, this kind of singularity is a manifestation of the fact that the potential causes the uncertainty. So you have two waves localized, they want to interact, but then they kind of bounce against the potential. And now in a normal situation, they would just come out uh, in the directions prescribed by the frequency, so being the sum of the two. But now because of the potential, this can be shifted and go around. And so in some sense, you kind of lose uh, control over this. And um, you don't know where this is coming out. And so in some sense, you should get something singular uh, that doesn't see the angles that well, but depends only on the magnitude. So that kind of sort of heuristically justifies in picture why you would expect something like this. And I guess that's it. Then you, you plug it into your, uh, your equation and then try to see uh, so to kind of fight all these problems. So the problems are that the frequencies don't sum to zero. So you have more uh, places where you have no oscillations. Then you have singular kernels and less integration by parts directions. And then because you have discrete spectrum, uh, like in the internal mode problem, there's a bad frequency that is forced and this creates an irregularity of F. And so you also have to kind of deal with that. And so we're able to kind of put this all together in this work with uh, Tristan Leger. I guess that's final comments is um, in one day we can kind of understand fairly well some classes of equations, but there are still many important problems to understand, um, like the internal mode or the resonances. In 3D, up this kind of nonlinear Fourier analysis, deal with non-trivial spectrum, we would like to get some applications to like real models, I guess, math physics, such as you know, topological solidons in D bigger than one. So hopefully the road. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Fabio. So uh, are there any questions from the audience? Sorry, I took a couple of minutes. Uh, Chung Chun, I have a question. Uh -huh. Yeah, so uh, uh -huh. yeah, okay. So Fabio, you mentioned that there are like different models in terms of like different non-linearities you put on the right hand side. And also you mentioned like the uh, physics uh, uh, like real models. So my question is like among those uh, questions, like try to understand the asymptotic behavior, uh, like the composition of the solutions, uh, what is the like from a physical point of view, what is people want to know? Okay, that's, uh, I think that's a good question. Uh, it kind of, I guess it depends, right? Because there are, there are, there are many, uh, there's many models you can look at. I guess one natural one or probably really hard um, is this one. Okay, so in 1D, these are all like physics. So if you open like a physics book um, and you look at the, the beginning, say in one D, you will find definitely you will find this. Uh, okay, for, that's for sure. And you find all the other types. So you find sine Gordon because it's integrable. So people have studied that. You find double sine Gordon. Uh, so the, all these models in one D you find, and they come from studying, uh, uh, I guess, ferromagnets or like yeah, magnetism. So maybe you have to. Yes, it's like a one model for some kind of interface and superconductors, I guess. Then if you move to 2D, okay, now you can ask uh, uh, many different things. So one, one natural model, which is simple to write, and it's similar to this, is the, is the Gizmur-Landau vortex. So this is, let me find the eraser. It doesn't erase. So, right, so this will be something like, so here I'm talking, so this model will be, Exactly so, exactly imagine the same. So, well, let's say phi tt uh, minus Laplacian phi, and then it's phi minus phi cube. So this is this model. This is exactly the same equation, uh, right? So Gibbs landau just refers to the fact that this is a double well, and then you can look at the relativistic case like here, you can look at the heat flow 
for this, so you can look at uh, the Hamiltonian Schrodinger flow, right? And so there are some partial results, like on the linear, so on the heat flow, it's a bit easier. So sometimes, you know, the heat flow, uh, it's a bit easier to study. And then, you know, in 2D, you can look at other things. You can look at, uh, you know, this Chen Simons, or if you go 3D, you can look at Young Mills, for example. So these have, you know, some models, uh, they admit like these kind of smooth uh, solutions that decay to some, to some, maybe go to one, like in this case, right? And then you would like to know, you know, even if one of them is stable, I think, you know, if you really talk to a math physicist, they want to look at a lattice, right? And okay, but this is too far for us. So I guess it's something different. Uh, you know, in physics, maybe you look at not having just one vortex, but you look at the lattice. And so this, but it's a different question. So here we look at one single solution that it's possibly smooth. Uh, it's a static solution, say, and then uh, what happens to perturbations? I don't know if that gives you like a general picture. Okay, okay, thank you. So are there any other questions? So Fabio, I wonder if the embedded eigenvalue occurs in some cases. Uh, here, I think, you know, this case is no, because then in the end, uh, once you extract the effective mass, then the potential decays to zero, right? So, uh -huh. so you never have uh, in all these models. And I think it also makes sense kind of physically, I guess. Um, you perturb like some state. Um, yeah. I mean, I've never seen like, uh, because then your potential, you know, in the end, uh, you see here, uh, you get this effect. This is kind of the effective mass, if you want, mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. particle, right? Mm -hmm. And then, what, but, you know, you take it out and then what's left, which is the V, uh, decays to zero, basically exponentially. I mean, maybe it doesn't in all models, right? But it still decays to zero. It's still in L2, so it doesn't, uh, you won't create an embedded value, right? Except, okay, you could have something at zero, right? So that's a different story. So at the... Uh, at the bottom of the spectrum, um, then you can have. This I didn't talk about much. Also because we didn't have exactly results on that. But maybe this paper will go. Okay. So any other questions? Uh, then let's thank Fabio again. Nice well, thank talk. You. Thank you again for the invitation. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you.